And the question that you have to ask is, if being good gets somebody into heaven, how good is good enough? And how many sins disqualify a person from being in there? Does God grade on the curve? Does he say the top 20% of all humans get in? The big word you saw on the screen when you came in is hamartiology, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y. It's the study of sin. Now, what we're hoping to do in this overview of theology is provide a big picture of God's story. History is his story. So what is the first three words of the, of the King James Bible? In the beginning... That's God. God. It starts with God. We're trying to provide a big picture of God's story from creation past, eternity past, when it entered into God's mind because of his nature to love. Love gives, love sacrifices, God is love. And so somewhere way back when, it came into the mind of God to create mankind in his own image, with the ability to love. In order to create the ability to love, he had to create the ability not to love. For if love is not a choice, it's not love. If man was a robot programmed to love, then he would be just an automaton, and God would not have given him that choice. So by giving man a choice to love, he also gave man the choice not to love. And that's what we're talking about tonight, is the absence of love, the absence of light, the absence of God, and what it begets in our culture. Now, our culture does not like to talk about sin. I've lived in Ashland now since 1984. I cannot count how many people I've talked to over the years who've said, I wish you Christians would get over this issue of sin. Why do you always want to make people feel guilty? What is the big deal with you Christians about trying to make people feel bad about themselves? Why can't you be positive? Why can't you speak energy into people instead of speaking negativism? Anybody heard that? Yeah, it's all over the place. Um, for one thing, um, sin, like death, is an unpleasant subject. People don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think of ourselves as bad or evil people. But the doctrine of sin in the Bible tells us that's exactly what we are by nature, is that we are by nature separated from God. And we're going to talk all about how that, the Bible presents that. But in our culture, it's almost like there's a new kind of legalism that has come into our culture, and it is this commandment, thou shalt only be positive. Thou shalt never whisper a word of negativism. negativism. But here's why I think it's important to talk about sin. We're going to get to the subject of grace, and grace is going to be the, like the climax of this whole story. Grace is getting God's riches at Christ's expense. It's my bad karma paid for by Jesus on the cross of Jesus Christ so that my sin, which has separated me from God, is now expiated and dealt with, not by me getting better, but by God becoming sin and taking my place as a sinner. So why talk about sin? Well, without really understanding sin, we will never really fully understand salvation. Can't do it. Can't do it. When we come to grips with our sinful nature and we understand ourselves, we see ourselves, I should say, as woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips, then we're ready to receive God's message of grace. Until a person sees themselves as needy, they're never going to reach out for God's grace through Jesus Christ. So what I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about this subject. Now, we're going to go a little further and talk behind the scenes about evil. What is evil? Let's begin with the broader question, what is evil and how did it get into our world? Well, the atheists, let's just start with them in general. I can't speak for them because I've never been an atheist. I grew up in a Christian home. I've always had this idea that there was a God. I just always had it. But there are those who've made the decision um, not to believe in God. They see sin as the natural outgrowth of evolutionary animalistic urges. We're just animals that have now arrived at a higher evolutionary plane. So why should it surprise us if we have animal urges? 
Um, they would see the problem of evil as that we have a problem with evil. That, that, that we just need to get over that and accept the fact that it's, it's there. In fact, I put a quote in your notes from Richard Dawkins. Um, he says this, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason for it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no other good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Spokesman for atheists everywhere. It's just you're an animal, so why should it surprise you? They also, though, would teach that as evolution continues, that we are rising above it. We're learning to be moral. We're going to pass that on to our generation, and eventually we're going to arrive at evolutionary utopia. And I don't know how they can look at anything and say that that's where we're headed, but that's, that's beside the point. What I put in your notes a little uh, thing about Marxists and the, uh, what we would call liberation ideologies. Um, Marxism, according to a guy named R.J. Rummel, estimated that in the 20th century alone, 110 million people died as a result of the theology, the ideology, and the approach of um, this old Marxist idea. Well, if I, as I studied it this week, getting ready for this class, I learned that those Marxists back in the day said, well, the problem with the world is the people who have power and that are abusing it on the workers. The 20% of the people who do all the work are suffering oppression, inequities, uh, financial abuse, and it's all because the people in power, the politicians, the royalty, the people who have the money, they're the ones that are problem. And he even gave them a word called Borgesizhosh. I said it wrong. Borgesizhosh. B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S-I-E. -I -I -E. There, there it is, bourgeois. See? Whatever. And his idea was that when the proletariat needs to rise up and throw them over. What he failed to do was understand that in the workers themselves, there was an evil heart. And that the oppressors became, or the oppressed became oppressors. And it's happened um, repeatedly in, in South Africa, all over the place, when you see one despot pushed out by a, somebody in revolution and then becomes exactly what, what they hate. Well, let's move on. What about the Eastern religions? Uh, Hinduism, um, Buddhism, some of the New Age philosophies that are very prevalent in our culture. Um, how do they see evil? And many of them see evil as just the obvious result of bad karma. That when you do bad, you get bad things. And that suffering is the consequence, the atonement for bad karma. Well, you say, what about the innocent, like children that are born sick or people that didn't do anything wrong? The Eastern religions throw in reincarnation and say, well, you must have done something wrong in a previous life. That's why you're having such a hard time in this life. Which is why, if you've studied anything about the Hindu religion, why uh, the caste society in India was so prevalent and is still very, very prevalent is because they felt like those who are on the bottom of the caste system are getting what they deserve. So for them to intervene to alleviate suffering is not to really help the person. You need to let them go ahead and suffer so that in the next life uh, they'll have a, a, a better, better situation. Uh, Buddha taught that the problem of suffering is really attachment. He used the analogy, and I've used it myself when talking about sin, of the monkey who is caught in the trap. They take a coconut and they carve a hole in the coconut, put something that the monkey likes inside that coconut. He puts his hand in, grabs the treat, and he can't get his hand out. Now, Buddha taught that as an example of that's mankind's problem, is that we're attached to these treats, these loves, he called them. He who has a thousand loves has a thousand woes, he said. And so his idea was that this, the answer for suffering is to detach, is to separate yourself, is to let go of any expectation. In fact, I would quote from what's called his first sermon. The end of suffering then is the complete cessation of that very thirst, giving it up, renouncing it, emancipation of oneself from it, detaching oneself from it. So Buddhism is the idea that if 
If you have something you love, it's only going to create suffering. So the way to do that is to not need anyone, not desire anything, but to completely detach. What I love about the gospel is it's quite the opposite, and that uh, the whole idea is love. It's about love, and it's about receiving and giving love and, and experiencing the best that God has. And so um, they look at life a little different than we do. What about the evangelical Bible believer? How do we see evil? Well, it's an answer very, very easily. It's evil is the consequence of sin, not karma, but sin. Um, I think all a person has to do is uh, take a preschool, take two kids or three kids, put one toy in the middle and watch what happens. It's just the nature of man is to fight, to grab, to take, to keep, to, to reach, to acquire. Um, J.I. Packer says the root of sin is pride and enmity against God. It's the spirit that was first seen in Adam's first transgression. Sinful acts have always been behind them, and the motives and desires that one way or another express the willful opposition of the fallen heart to God's claims on our lives. I think Packer's right. That the problem with the world, the problem with me, uh, is sin. J.K. Chesterton answered a paper in, in Britain. The question that people were to write in is, what's wrong with the world? J.K. Chesterton wrote a, a, word, a letter back, and he simply said, I'll tell you what's wrong with the world. I am. And he signed his name. I am. That's the problem with the world, is that there are people in it. Um, the Bible teaches that this sin nature that we inherited from our father are, is undeniable um, and is ex experienced in anybody that's honest about it. Um, so let's move on. Well, let's talk about where did sin come from? Uh, I'll throw out a couple of non-biblical ideas for you. If you wanted to do some more research on these, you can. Uh, I got these uh, from a theology book that I'm using, um, and you're certainly welcome to look them up. But Frederick Tennant uh, thought that the source of sin was just the animal nature, uh, very evolutionary in his thinking. He believed that evolution is just carrying the human race ultimately towards this utopian that I spoke of when I talked about that section. A guy named Reinhold Niebuhr said that sin is the result of man's tension between his aspirations, what he desires, and his inability to achieve those aspirations so men are frustrated. They want something, can't get it. Their inability causes them to, to lash out in selfish acts. Uh, so his answer was... You just need to become um, more and more uh, aware of your limitations and just give it up. Just surrender and accept what, what you can. That's not really what the Bible teaches at all. Paul Tillich uh, related sin to what he called the existential estrangement from the ground of all being. Yes, you heard it here. I know. I know. It's impressive to hear that. The existential or estrangement from the ground of all being. The ground of all being was his definition of God, that God is the source of all being. And when you're estranged from that and not accepting and yielded to that and a part of that, then it, it causes you to become more self-centered, more destructive in your choices, thereby perpetuating this sin and evil and suffering that happens in the world. Uh, liberation theologians, um, there are many um, who came along and, and taught that sin is the result of economic struggle. If we could just have everybody in a good environment, that then they would, they would rise above. Uh, there's the solution to the sin problem is to eliminate oppression um, in possessions and power, spread the money around, and evil and suffering will go away. Um, it's just not true. It's just not true. And somebody named Harrison Sacker Elliott uh, viewed individual competitiveness as the source of sin. And so he said, if we could just educate people that competitiveness is not good, they'll stop. Right? How's that working out? What does the Bible say? Well, thank you for asking. I, I know you were asking. You could put this one sentence definition for sin, and this is on the back side. Sin is any lack of conformity, active or passive. To the moral law of God. Lack of conformity, not lining up, not uh, either actively or passively somehow failing to accomplish and to arrive and to submit to and live out the, the moral law of God. Let's break that down just a little bit. According to the Bible in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and what? Fall short of glory of God. The word used there, for all have sinned, is the word hamartos, which is where we get the theology word 
hamartiology, missing the mark. And it could be that either you're not aiming at the right mark or the mark you are aiming at and trying to hit is, is not the highest mark that you could be. The Bible uses it in a variety of ways. But I think the best way is to just understand it. If God's glory is what we talked about last week as he is transcendent, he, he sits above all things, he is holy and pure and right and good. And we believe that because that would make sense of what he's, we see in the world of who created all of this and the intent of the gospel. Then the failure to, to achieve that in our lives is to fall short. Um, the Bible also calls sin the transgression. Transgression is a different Greek word. And it, it literally means to, to fail to walk the line. So if you think of um, where there's a, a path and, and you're to walk on that path that transgression is stepping out of bounds. Transgression is a transgression of the law. In 1 John 3, 4, the scripture says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And that's that same word, transgression. And sin is lawlessness. The Bible says that sin is ultimately rebellion against God. Deuteronomy 9, 7 says, Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day you departed from the land of Egypt till you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. You knew what he wanted. You failed to do what he wanted. That's an act of rebellion. Joshua 1, 18 actually says, Whoever rebels against God's command and does not heed your words and all that he commands him shall be put to death. The soul that sins, it shall be die. Uh, Romans 3.10, the wages of sin is still death. All right. But let's break this out a little bit. Okay, those are broad definitions. Let's kind of break this down just a little bit more on the nature of sin. We're going to talk about the uh, source of it in a minute. We would want you to understand this clearly, that sin is not necessarily a behavioral focus. It is, it is an inward inclination. And I like to say it this way, that we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Why does a dog bark at the moon? He's a dog. Why do pigs like to wallow in the mud? Because they're pigs. Now, you can take that pig and you can wash him up. You can put a bow on him. You can take, give him a bath in Chanel Number no. 5. That's an old perfume for all those who are back in the old day. But still, the nature of that pig is to get in the mud, to wallow in the mud, because his nature is that, that way. Well, when we see it, that's an inward inclination, that it's not so much that I'm doing bad things, which would make me a bad person, it's that I'm broken. I've got a fallen nature. I've got a nature that I'm not as bad as I could, as I could be, and people are not as bad as they might be, but they're not as good as they could be either, not good as good as they should be. The question I always like to ask people that are trying to be good people, um, over the years, I, I don't hear it as much as I used to. People saying, I'm trying to live by the Ten Commandments. I used to say, well, can you quote them for me? Um, that would kind of usually catch them up. But mostly I hear people say, I'm just trying to be a decent person. I feel like I'm just going to take my chances when I get to God. And, and um, if he looks at my life and says, I've been a pretty decent person, he's going to you know, let me in. I'm just willing to take my chances that I'm better than most. And the question that you have to ask is, if being good gets somebody into heaven, how good is good enough? And how many sins disqualify a person from being in there? Does God grade on the curve? Does he say the top 20% of all humans get in and the rest of you, you're out of luck? You ever had a teacher that graded that way? Thankfully, I had a guy in, in Bible history that graded that way, or I would have been effed all the way through that class but he took the top 20% and I happened to fall in the middle 40 and uh, got past that class, thank the Lord. But that's not the way God works. How good is good enough? Um, how many sins does it take to be a sinner? And I like to ask people, how many lies does it take to be a liar? How many times do you have to steal to be a thief? How many sins do you have to commit to be a sinner? Only one. And the Bible tells us in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if anyone should keep the whole law, let's say you could keep the entire law perfectly, but you offend in one point, you're a lawbreaker. And as a lawbreaker, then you're guilty of the consequence of that lawbreaking, which is death and separation. 
from God. So sin is an inward inclination. But it's also um, disobedience and rebellion. I really want to emphasize this. That rebellion is an, an not living up to my own standards or the standards of the God that I believe or profess to believe in. Um, if I have a standard that I expect for other people and I don't live up to myself, that's disobedience, that's a failure to meet the mark. If I know that the standard is elevated above me and I choose to say, I don't like that, I don't want to do that. The speed limit is 55, I'm driving, driving 60. Why? Well, because, just because, that's why. Because you told me to drive 55, I'm going to drive 60. You tell me to sit down, I'm going to want to stand up. Anybody else like that in the room? You tell me that it says, wet paint, do not touch, I'll tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to touch it, even if it gets on my finger because you told me not to. Um, sorry that that's true about me, but, and you, maybe that's not true about you, but it is true about the person you're sitting next to. Right? All right. Sin is disobedience and rebellion. Here's an interesting quote from Romans chapter 2, verse 14. Write this in your notes. I don't know if I gave you the rest of reference or not. Um, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts either accusing or excusing them. The Apostle Paul seemed to think that all people everywhere have a moral law that God placed within them. Um, my favorite example of that is my own son when he was growing up. Um, we would be in the other room and we would hear him say, what? And we knew he was into something. <laughs> what? He was touching something, playing with something, getting into something. He knew he shouldn't do it. And he did that way, 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 way early. What was going on in that little boy's heart? Who was, who was talking to him when, what? Well, I'll tell you what, his heart was talking to him. His conscience was saying, nah, 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 but he was doing it anyway. What? And I think that you have to be, at some point in your life, you become conscious of the fact that you knew that was wrong to do, and you did it anyway, for whatever reason. I'll never forget when uh, me and some buddies stole some candy from the little market there in our little town of Julieta, Idaho, and... And when I was caught and busted, uh, my mother asked me this question, Mark, why'd you do that? I had money. How do you answer a question like that? I can tell you how this eight-year-old boy asked, answered it. Duh, I don't know. Isn't that a good answer? I don't know. It was there. I took it. Of course, my mother had a solution for that. And uh, that never happened again. She said, you're going to stay in your room and think about it till your dad gets home. Yeah, hallelujah. It was not a good thing. My dad must have had a 60-inch waist because when he pulled that belt off, it seemed like it took forever. And man, oh man, I had five pair of underwear on. I knew I was going to get it that day. Um, so anyway, sin is disobedience and rebellion. But here's the thing, and it's, these are all intricately uh, interwoven and overlapping. Sin involves or entails spiritual disability. Don't think of that in a, in a derogatory way. Think of that in a sense of saying we're limited as human beings. We are not God. I heard John Corson give a sermon once, and he said that the thing that humans need to get is that they're, they're odd, they're not God, right? And we're all that way. We're all odd, and we're not God. There is a God, but you're not him. And that's what we need to really establish. Sin is a spiritual disability. The image of God in mankind has been distorted, corrupted. Our DNA has been polluted. And as that, we have a predisposition towards sin. Now, I personally believe that that does not make me culpable until I give in to it. But every human being eventually gives in to it. And it's at that point when a person says, I know this is wrong and I'm going to do it anyway, when he becomes culpable. And we're going to talk about that when we get to the next section. Sin is also just the incomplete fulfillment of God's righteous standards. We've already kind of talked about that. I think I'm going to skip that part. Um, Sin is at its root displacement of God. When we read the Genesis account here in a minute, uh, we'll see it very clearly that the big temptation for Eve and for Adam to was to move aside and become their own gods and make their own decisions and arrive at their own uh, ultimate 
stage of rebellion. When you recognize God and God is center in your life, then things begin to revolve around it. Last week I talked to you about Isaiah's eye-opening moment when he recognized that God was high and holy and lifted up. And then he saw himself, and he, he, all he could do is repent. No longer was he pointing fingers at other people saying, woe is you and woe is you and woe is you. Now he's saying, woe is me, all right? Well, when a person puts God where they belong, then everything else begins to fall in place. And a self-awareness, not a depreciation of myself, but an understanding of myself. Um, if you don't examine yourself to that point, at some point where you begin to say, I've pushed God to the side, I've put myself in the center, I've climbed on the throne of my own heart, the throne room in my own heart is occupied by me, little s, self, and that's when things go south, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian. When you put yourself on the throne of your life and God is asked to step aside, then things go south in a hurry. Um, God said in Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. When they asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment, what did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, right? That is a total God-centered life. Mind, will, heart, strength, passion, loving God. Well, when that's not the case, then we're in that self-directed independent, rebellious condition. Let's uh, go to this. Where, where did sin come from? Uh, we'll talk a whole lot about this when we get into the actual uh, series on homardiology uh, later. But for now, because this is an overview, let me just make sure that I make this very clear. And I hope you can just maybe not take this by faith, but understand that the Bible does teach this very clearly, that God cannot be the originator or the author of sin. You say, well, if God put Adam and Eve in the garden with the capacity to sin, and he knew that they were going to sin because of his foreknowledge, then wasn't it something that God anticipated and allowed for and prepared for? And the answer is yes, he did, obviously. But did he create sin? Well, I would say no. The Bible says no. And here's the verse for it. James chapter 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt any man. God made rocks. If man uses those rocks to throw at other men, is God the author of sin because he made the rock? No. If God gave a man and a woman a moral ability to choose good and thereby choose evil, and they chose evil... Is God the originator of that sinful choice that they made? We would say as evangelical Christians, no, they're not. There are those in the more Calvinistic uh, camp who would say God, and there's a verse in, in Isaiah that they quote that God says, I create both the good and the evil. And it is in there, and you can look it up. And they would say, well, that says that God wanted evil. He made the devil so that the devil would tempt Eve and etc. And I just say there's a theological word for that, and it's <clears throat> I just don't believe it. I just don't, just don't believe it. We're going to go way deeper into that subject later. And I have some strong opinions about it. You didn't notice that, did you? Um, but we would say um, there is some truth in the fact that sin in God's created universe began in the heavenly realm with Lucifer. When you read the account in Genesis 3 and you see the fact that this creature, this snake, this serpent who beguiled Eve into eating the fruit, we understand that, that he is a demonic spirit known as Lucifer. And so sin originated in the angelic world. Let me write, give you some scriptures. John 8, 44, 1 John 3, 8, and 1 Timothy 3, 6, and Jude 6. These all have references to fallen angels. Um, God created a host of angels. And at some point before he created the cosmos and put the Garden of Eden where he put it, at some point, those legions of angels, a third of them, fell away from God and rebelled. In John 8, 
my greatest theologian is Jesus, and Jesus said in John 8, 44, he said, he spoke of the devil as a murderer from the beginning. And when he said the beginning, he used the phrase as kat arches in the Greek. Kat arches, according to most theologians, is before creation, in the very beginning when creation happened. So who was the murderer from the beginning? Jesus said Satan was. He was the murderer from the very beginning, uh, which means that he was around before creation was around. In 1 John 3, 8, John, who learned from Jesus, uh, said that he, the devil, sins from the beginning. Most people believe, most theologians, theologians that Satan's sin resulted from his pride. And they quote a reference in Isaiah. We'll talk more about this later, too, where he says, I'm going to be like the Most High. I, and he, he wants to achieve, because of his beauty, this uh, ascendance above God himself. They weren't satisfied to keep their own abode where God had placed them, but they had a desire for, for more, which led them to rebel against God. For mankind, sin originated in the garden with Adam and Eve. Now, regardless of what you think about whether Adam and Eve were literal people or whether they were symbolic people or whether they were, you know, everything was made in six days. That's not the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible is that when sin came into the world, it came in as a deliberate choice of a creature God had placed in there with the capacity not to sin, and he had the capacity to sin. So get, grab your Bible. Let's read about it in Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. This is a long section of Scripture, but I want to read it all so that you see the whole story. Genesis 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he's putting a question mark on what God said already. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not, or you shall not surely die. So first he puts a question mark, and then he puts a, you know, an exclamation point that that's not really going to happen. It's not really true. And then he says in verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And this is critical right here, verse 6. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw with her eyes, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband two key words with her. He, he wasn't absent somewhere else, you know, uh, he was with her when this whole thing went down. He could have stopped her. He could have helped her, but he, he didn't. He was complicit with it. He willfully and deliberately ate. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, well, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? And then the man said, the woman you gave to me, be with me. She gave me of the garden or of the tree, and I ate. The Lord said, God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed more than the cattle, more than every beast of the field on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, your conception in pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten the, from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb, herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, 
for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's where sin started, in the garden. Uh, when Eve was deceived by Satan, he used three things. He used the lust of the flesh, something that she craved, something that she could see, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which we're going to get to later. It's kind of the way the devil still works uh, in, in many, uh, most situations. Take your Bible now and go with me to Romans 5.12. This is a key for re reference in your New Testament. I want you to see this. By the way, if any of this confuses you, don't forget we will have a time for you to answer or ask questions at the end. You don't have to ask questions about what we're studying, but you can if you want to. Romans 5 and verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. Sin entered mankind through the disobedience of Adam. That disobedient nature, that broken, fallen nature, was then passed into his children, and into his children, and into his children. And we'll talk a whole lot about this, that he was the representative of the human race, he was also the federal head of the human race, he made choices that affected me. Look up this way for just a minute. Let me give you an example of how that works. Every 4th of July, I celebrate freedom that I personally did not pay for. I did not sign the Declaration of Independence, but I am a benefactor of those who did way back in 1776. Their decision is something I experienced the consequences of. You follow? In the same way, we would declare that Adam's choice that he made way back in the garden because some would say, well, wait a minute, that's not fair. Why should I pay for Adam's sin? Adam did that. Well, here's how the Bible says it. Sin passed upon all men, but now death passed upon all men because all have sinned. So while I was a sinner by nature, I ultimately became a sinner by choice. So I had a predisposition. You say, well, you couldn't help yourself. Why should you be held responsible for something you couldn't help? It's because God was trying to set up, I believe, this whole picture of no wonder you need a savior. You need, a, you need a redeemer. You need a rescuer. And the very first promise in the Bible is in Genesis 3 when he says to the serpent, I'm gonna, he, you're going to bruise his head, but I'm going to raise up from this woman, from her seed, singular, that's going to crush your head. That's the first promise of redemption that we see, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we move ahead. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Take your Bible. If you're still in Romans, go to the right a few pages to the book of Ephesians. And I've got it up on the screen too. Not all of it, but most of it here. It says, And you he made alive. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you he made alive, and this is critical here, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, by, among whom, verse 3, watch this, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and here's a phrase I want you to underline, and were by nature... Children of wrath, just as the others. And then that wonderful verse 4, but God who's rich in mercy. Thank the Lord for the but gods in the Bible. We'd be in big, big trouble if it wasn't for God's grace. But the emphasis, according to Paul's theology, which is my theology, is that when I was born, I was born dead, spiritually dead. When God said, the day that you eat of it, Adam, you're going to die, did he die? But he didn't die for some hundreds of years later, did he? But I submit to you that, no, he died the very day that he ate of it. It's my conviction uh, that man has three parts to him, a mind, a body, soul, and spirit. And that when his soul sinned, 
that spirit part of him that connected with God, that was able to be with God, that was righteous before God, that died. He still could think, he could still feel, he could still reason. He still had his faculties where he could see, taste, smell, and all the various things he could do. But his ability to be in God's presence without guilt, without a self-awareness of his own lack, died the very minute he took that bite of whatever fruit that was. And the, the proof of it is, he looks around and he says to his wife, you're naked. She goes, I wouldn't talk, buddy. You're naked too. And they covered themselves, began the whole process that man's done ever since of trying to cover up their own inadequacies, that which causes them to feel shameful, that which causes them to hide. And, and then they did the very natural thing that we all do. They started finger pointing. Adam says, it really wasn't me, God. It was the woman you gave me. Really, I wouldn't have ever done it if you hadn't given me a fallen woman. She's the problem. And the woman pointed at the snake, and we're all pointing at each other. And man, is it happening today. Yeah. People love to finger point. So let's talk a little bit about where this thing happens and how the practical side of it uh, is. I put in your study notes uh, a little outline that I heard years and years ago, and I've used it a lot, that we have, as humans, three enemies. We have an external enemy, that's the world that we're around. The culture that we're around, according to Romans chapter 2, tries to push us into its mold. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed into this world. The, one of the modern versions says, don't be pressed into the world's mold. Uh, we have a very strong influence about the culture, advertising, TV, friendships, um, everything we see around us is inducing us to be self-centered, self-fulfilled, to grab what we want, to go after with gusto what makes us happy. And even there's this unwritten idea that humans have somehow got is that, that it's my human right to be happy. And if I'm not happy, then I'm, I have the right to do whatever I need to do to make myself happy. Um, that's, a lot of that's coming from the world in which we live. But we also have an internal enemy. If you were to go somewhere remote, let's say you could find a desert island where you could just go and be by yourself. Would you be free from sin there? The truth is you would take your own worst enemy with you. You. You would still have your thoughts. You would still have your ambitions. You would still have your negative attitude about various things. You would still be a complainer. You would still be a whiner. You would still be you. No matter where you end up, you have an internal enemy, and that's the flesh. But we also have an infernal enemy, and, and I believe in a literal devil. I uh, got to lead a, a, um, an attorney and his wife to the Lord. And the reason they came to faith, both of them were agnostics, but they were prosecuting attorneys in Arizona. And they worked together in the same office, and they began to deal with people that were evil, pure evil. Pure evil. And both of them said that not together, but separately, they came to the awareness that if there's pure evil, which they had been across the table from and seen eye to eye, if there is pure evil, is there pure good? And they both went to an Episcopal church, tried to find some answers that came here. God opened their hearts, and it's really kind of wonderful how the whole thing came about. But their entrance into this whole thing of God and God's goodness and the grace and the need for the cross was all about the fact that they had come face to face with pure evil. It really does exist. I believe in a devil. I don't blame everything on the devil. Uh, Philip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. You know, that'd be nice to be able to say, it's not really my fault, it's the devil. Um, i be honest with you, I think I make most of my own, I dig my, my own ditches that I, I fall into myself. But the devil does have a part to play in it. James chapter 1 Verse 14. I'm going to put this verse up on the screen in just a little bit. But what I want you to see is that when James said, when man's tempted, don't say I'm tempted by God. God can't be tempted by sin, nor does he himself tempt anyone. All right? God does not tempt. And then James goes on in James 1.14 to say this, for every man is drawn away by his own desires... And enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death or leads to death. So there's a progress. And God says that the progress begins with a desire. Now, desires are not necessarily bad things. 
God put the desire for a man to eat food. If man didn't satisfy that desire, he would die. But can that desire be corrupted and distorted? Evidence A. Exhibit A. Um, God gave the desire for, for men and women to procreate, to have sex. If they had not followed that desire, the human race would die out. It's a God-given desire. Can that desire be distorted? Look at the world in which we live. The answer is obvious. So having the desire is not a bad thing. Um, I found a quote that I really liked from uh, Willard, um, in, Willard Erickson in his book, Introducing Christian Doctrine. It says, humans have the capacity, unlike animals, to choose alternatives, including alternatives which are not immediately present. Humans can thus transcend their location. Let me give you an example. He gives an example. He says, they can envision themselves occupying a different position in society or married to a different partner. Thus, we may desire not only what is actually available to us, but also what is not proper or legitimate. This capacity greatly expands the possibilities of sinful actions and or thoughts. So desire itself is not a problem. When Eve saw the food that it was desirous to, for food, it was good to eat, it was good to look upon. All right, that desire itself was not the sin. The desire gave in to sin, and that's when things began. So I think it's the lust of the flesh. To desire to enjoy things is not a bad thing. I think it's a God-given hunger that we have to, to, to be content, to have fulfillment, to enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with that desire. Can it lead us to press after and chase after passions that are not good, take us places that we don't, shouldn't belong, and, and, and really wonder somehow, how do we ever get there? Well, it's because we gave in uh, to the distortion of the lust of the flesh. We have the desire to obtain things. That's a God-given desire, too. God told man, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Obtaining things is not the problem. But letting those things become the source of our identity or our idol worship or where we go to when we're sad or mad or bored, that's your God, whatever that is. And if you go after things, it is really giving in to the lust of the eyes. I want it. I'm going to pursue it. You have it, I want it. Jealousy, covetousness, all that stuff flow out of that, that lusting of the eyes. And then this idea of accomplishing or the desire to do things, that's a God-given desire too. Um, we had a devotion this morning from Justin. He was saying, when you guys were young, did you envision yourself being you know, something grand, like an NBA star or, or whatever. We, made a, we had a lot of laughs about Brett being an a NFL lineman, in the idea of him being 600 pounds and all the rest. It was kind of fun to think about. However, the point is, it's not wrong to desire something, but that a desire to accomplish something can lead an individual to, to make choices that are abusive to others, that... Uh, maybe exploits or takes from or takes away from uh, someone else without proper limits. It, it is pursued at the expense of, of others, and that's the, the pride of life. So what is the answer to all of this? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next week. There is an answer. The, my Bible tells me that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. It's, it's um, one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And you have to always set it up with the idea that grace is only grace when you understand that it cannot be deserved, it cannot be earned, you cannot qualify for it other than saying, I'm a guilty, undeserving sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If that's never occurred in your life, I've had people sat in church for years. Uh, one individual was actual uh, Sunday school teacher in our ministry in our previous church who came to the awareness at some point that, that she had never really saw herself as a, as a sinner. She was better than most. She was a good person. She had never done anything wrong. In her words, she said, I'd never robbed a bank. I'd never killed anyone, and I never kicked my dog. Well, but 
that didn't mean that she didn't have a wicked little sinner's heart in her, and she became fully aware of it. And when that happened, then, then uh, she became in love, deeply in love with Jesus, who, who took our sin upon himself and died on a cross. And that I can't wait to talk about. I am going to have Chris teach some of that, so you're going to get an exposure to this young uh, intern. Some theolog- We're trying to raise him up to be a theologian, so that's going to be fun too. What we're going to do tonight, last week we had questions from the floor, and it didn't work real good on the recording. Um, so since this is going into various places where your question might be a, a good question, did you ever have a teacher said that there's no such thing as a stupid question? Yeah. That's stupid. There are some very stupid questions. Um, But there's no question that's out of line. You want to ask a question, that's the microphone you need to go to. Just step right up to the microphone. The camera is going to pick you up, and I'm going to listen to your question and see if I can answer that. Anybody have a question? You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. Brother Eric, is his mic on? Am I on? Hello. No. Let's see if it may be muted. Maybe it shouldn't be on for my question. No, it's on. We like you. (laughs) There it is. All right. I do have one question. Great. And it might be for later. Okay. Um, But you were talking about God and sin, and he doesn't create sin. Yes. Yes. And it said that the devil always was a sinner. The sinner from the beginning. From so when, the beginning, yeah. so could you explain that a little bit? Yeah. When I say the, the, the phrase in the beginning, most theologians believe that that's the in the beginning Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But there was something created before that, the angelic beings that were created before that, we believe, based on the fact that in God's perfect creation, a sinful creature came in known as the serpent, Lucifer, right? So at some time before creation, in the beginning, the devil had already committed his sin against God, rebelled against God. That's the way we would, we would approach that, that he had already fallen from grace in the heavenlies, before God spoke the cosmos into existence that you and I see today, which would be the beginning that they're referring to. When Jesus said, the devil is a murderer from the beginning, he didn't mean I made him. Now, the people have taken it that way, and those who would say that God created evil would say that, see, God made the devil, and he made him evil. So God's the originator of sin. But that contradicts very clearly what the Bible says in James Uh, Chapter 1, that God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. I hope that answers a little bit. We're going to get way deeper in that because there's all kinds of theologians and theories around that that play into your doctrine of salvation later when you understand what is grace and how free is man's free choice. Did he really have a choice or was he just programmed to make that choice? Did he really have the freedom or did God in his sovereignty Make sure that he chose the right thing that he chose. And so there's, as you probably already know, there's smarter people than I that argue that thing um, ad nauseum. And I'll add my confusion to it when we get to that. Any other questions? Please. Yeah, I'll move it down for you. Yeah, that works. Here you go. Thank you. You mentioned uh, Adam died uh, before his years put mm-hmm. him to death. And you said his soul died. Yeah, well, I meant to say his spirit died. Spirit died. Okay. Yeah. Could you just talk about Let me, Well, there, there are people who are dichotomous. They believe that man only has two natures, his soul and his body. I'm a trichotomist. I believe that when God said, let's make man in our image that he is a triune being. He made men triune beings with a body. That part's obvious. I can see it. Then my soul is comprised of mind, will, and emotions. I have the ability to think, I have the ability to feel, and I have the ability to choose. All right? 
But I also have what Ephesians calls a spirit that you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Well, what was dead? I could still think, I could still feel, I could still choose. I still had a body. Well, what was dead? I submit it was the spirit that was dead. And when Adam sinned, his soul remained alive, his body remained alive for a few more years, but it was already predetermined because of his rebellion that that too would die. Sin brought about death. But I think he died instantly, spiritually. There was a consequence between his relationship with God that was affected by his rebellion. So that's why I'm what they call a trichotomist, body, soul, spirit. And the spirit died when Adam sinned. So when my kids are born and they look so innocent, you know, and you look at them, they're so cute. How could, any, how could anybody say that this little baby has a wicked little sinner's heart? Well, they, they, they're cute. They have a cute body. At least my kids were cute. Some of yours are not so cute. But they also, when they got old enough, displayed the ability to make deliberate, selfish, sinful choices. So their spirit was, was dead. They had all that. Did that answer your question a little bit? Okay. Yeah, I did catch myself when I said his soul died. I meant to say his spirit died. Thank you. Yeah, if you have questions, just make your way on up. I'll try to do my best to confuse you. Okay, so we know that Jesus defeated Satan at the cross. Yep. Why is Satan still ruling and reigning on the earth? That's a good question. That's a, that is a good question. I think he's a defeated foe. His days are numbered. Um, but the actual defeat was a spiritual defeat, that the power of sin was broken, the power of death was broken. Uh, when Jesus got up out of the grave, very, very literally, the Scripture says he's got the keys of death and hell. And so I think that's where the defeat really accomplished. But um, what Satan thought was going to be his ultimate triumph in getting the Messiah on the cross ended up being his ultimate demise. Because in the death of Jesus, there was so much more there than, than the death of just one Jewish carpenter. There was the, the substitutionary death. He died as man. There was the federal headship where he died for men. So he's not only taking my place as a substitute, but he's also in the sense dying. Just as Adam made a, sin, a choice to bring sin into the world and that passed on to people... Jesus' choice then passed on to those who would believe. And so that's where I think Satan is, is defeated. He's just like a lion um, that has no teeth. He roars, but he can't bite. Brother Steve. So if um, the spirit is dead in um, those who, don't, um, who sin, so I still sin. Me too. Yet I have Jesus as my Savior. Is my spirit alive or is it dead? Well, I would say it's alive. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. Uh, what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, that I do. And then he says, what is it? But sin dwells in me. I have this nature that's part of me that is going to be with me until I croak. It's just the way it is. But I also have a new nature in me that I think is perfect. That new nature is the nature that Jesus resurrected when he brought salvation to my heart and to your heart. So that is where um, that conflict comes. I think we all feel it, where we have a desire to do good, but sin dwells in us. Paul would say, it's no longer I that sins, but, but, or, but it's sin that dwells in me. And then I love the way he ends that chapter. Romans chapter 6 ends with this question, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Right? It's a rhetorical question. And the answer is, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I think salvation occurs when a person submits to Jesus, they're forgiven, but they still have that sin nature that God is beginning progressively through sanctification to change. You know, the sins I committed when I was a brand new Christian, I don't struggle with anymore, but God keeps peeling that onion lower and lower and lower. I still have more sin, and I find the more the longer I live, the, the more depraved I actually feel. But God is working that out, and one of these days... He's going to take me out of this sinful body, give me a brand new body that doesn't have sin in it. That's the day I'm looking forward to um, when we stand before the Lord. Hey, this has been good. Thank you guys for showing up tonight. Let's pray together. Um, 
Uh, if I can answer any more questions for you, uh, stick around if you'd like to. But I hope to see you uh, as we continue this overview of theology. Lord, we just